as I said, the rain over the air, the rain makes Liberians stay home. Notwithstanding the fact since they've been born, every year you go through the rain period. But thank God and thank the, the radio station that are covering us that they can sit at home and learn and participate with us in this process. This morning we had on the air a few minutes ago uh, Dr. Stan E. Jose. He will be testifying testifying a true personality repertoire of Liberian history who've dedicated over 20 or more of his years in the interest of Liberia. He has with Dr. Edward Dunn in 1984 written the historical dictionary of Liberia. He's written area development in Liberia toward integration and participation. That was also in 1984. With, he's written a, a land and life remember American Liberian folk architecture. He did that with B. L. Hermer et al. In 1967, he wrote a standardization of Liberian ethnic nomenclature. That was in 1979. And in 1967, a study guide for Liberia. Dr. Holsey, in 1966, wrote the Condo Confederation of Western Liberia. And the, small, the Black Scanner. America and the Liberian labor crisis in 1929 to 1936, a book review, and slave trading among the Vi of Liberia and Sierra Leone. He gave a lecture in 1973. Apart from that, Dr. Hosen has been very much interested in Liberia, Liberia's problem, Liberia's successes, as well as the failure. He is the founding editor of the Liberian Study Journal, Liberian Working Papers, and Liberian Monograph Series, and members of the African Study Association, the Society of Virginia Island Historians. A founding member of the Liberian Studies Association and lifetime member of the Association of Caribbean History. A graduate of Boston, University, he, who he has a PhD, and he is currently a professor emeritus of anthropology at the University of Delaware. After the son, I'm Commissioner Pearl Brown Bull, chair on historical review, and after the son of our chairman, Councillor Jeroen J. Voidia Senior, who will be hearing the voice of Dr. Steve Colsey. Thank you, Commissioner Boone. Dr. Holso, on behalf of the Commission, we want to extend to you greetings and welcome you to Liberia and to these proceedings. We also extend to you our gratitude in honoring our invitation to come and make a presentation to the Commission. You come today as an expert witness to the Commission against the background of 14 years of conflict and many more years of uh, political turmoil and conflict uh, in Liberia. After the peace agreement was signed in 2003, the TRC was established as a forum to help Liberians transcend the troubled past uh, in building a new future on reconciliation and sustaining the current peace that we have. Much it's been attached to this process, and we are happy that you could come to be a part. We say thanks and welcome again. I will use this time now, sir, to introduce commissioners here present, following which we will move into your presentation. At the right end of the panel is Commissioner Sheikh Kafuma Conan. Next to him is Commissioner Umu Sila. And next to her is Commissioner Per Brambu, who oversights our historical review process, which is ongoing now. Immediate at my left is Commissioner John Stewart, and next to him is Commissioner Gerald Coleman. I 
I am Jerome Verdier. We say thank you so much. You are welcome. It's all yours. Thank you very much for your greetings and for your welcome, Commissioner Verdier. Thank you, Commissioner Cole, for arranging this, and to your fellow commissioners on the PR on the TRC. Uh, let me start today uh, in that I would like to suggest some ways to look at uh, what I will call troubled boundaries. Although many of these boundaries may not have directly led to the Civil War, what they created was an environment of tensions in the society which served as an underlying troubled base for, from which particular issues could bubble up to outright overt violence. By structuring a way to look at the general situation and to provide a few examples, it may be useful to provide a framework for the TRC and ultimately Liberians to come to grips with the past and at the same time create a mechanism to look for sustainable ways of confronting contested social issues. Let me emphasize that I do not presume to have all of the answers, nor are my examples exhaustive, but hopefully these comments may be useful. To start with, I'd like to provide some ground rules which I have used to frame the issues at hand. In general, we live in a world in which we try to make sense of what happened in the past and what continues to happen around us. Thus, this is one of the reasons for the TRC, and especially this hearing. This is not to say that there are not situations which confound us, and we cannot, at least in the short term, figure out why some person or some group has done what they have done. In general, as I say, we think there is a logic which exists, even if it may not be clearly understood, or may be of a nature that is deeper than the overt and immediate situation. Thus we strive for ways to reach that, that understanding, and in so doing, to then try to make sense of what has happened. It is with this premise that I want my remarks to be understood. It is a structured approach, which ultimately may allow for, at least seemingly, uh, some understanding of even the irrational behavior. In addition, I believe that things are always in flux, that people take their perceived knowledge and use it, usually to their advantage. Thus, there is a constant social dynamic in which what, we, what might be thought of as established truths are suddenly manipulated or transformed to be used for other purposes than what was their original intent. And finally, as a consequence of the above, I believe that directed change has to start with what is perceived as existing, which is then transformed into something new. Change cannot be imposed as if there is a cultural vacuum. If this is done, quite often people will maintain an underlying hostility to the imposed change, and in time figure out strategies to repulse the change or manipulate it to more closely fit their earlier perceived standard. The, quote, obvious, unquote, idea for change may not, may not always be an obvious to an existing society. So those are some, some of the ground rules I'd like to use to take on the topic of looking at what has been entitled by the TRC, namely Liberia's past, reality, myth, falsehood, and conflict, as it had impact on the Civil War. What I would like to do then is first to look at some areas of dispute or conflict, namely troubled boundaries. I pick this subject because not only were many of them bases for the outbreak of, outbreak of violence, but there were others that served as bases for social discontent, even if not the actual cause for overt conflict. These unsettled boundaries provided a general base which allowed other disputed areas to flourish. Secondly, I would like to try to explain why disputes may have occurred. Thirdly, to look at what room there is for mediating those troubled boundaries. And finally, to suggest some possible mechanisms for continuing an oversight of the progress being made to resolve the troubled areas of social dis dispute. Recently, in an article in the Daily Observer, it was stated that the core problem was, quote, that things went wrong because everyone was aggrieved. Every, 
everyone wanted to find a way out of the malaise. So we all went mad. Unquote. What were the areas in which disputes occurred? What was the underlying malaise? There are many areas that can be named. I will start with what for many may seem the obvious, governance. This is clearly the topic which attracts most attention as it seems to lie at the core of everything else in, Liberian social, in the Liberian social system. Let, let me uh, look back at something of the history of Liberia's situation. In the past, prior to the arrival of the American returnees to Africa, there were at least two major differing political systems operating within what is today's Liberian borders. For a quick means of talking about these systems, I will refer to, to one of them as being the southern and south, southeastern areas of Liberia. Uh, there are exceptions, but essentially what I'm thinking about are the speakers of the Kruan languages, today's recognized Kruan, Grebo, Kru, Basa, and Day. There are also the Kua, also known as Bele, but they have been surrounded and have been in many ways changed by their neighbors. The second group is the central northern and west, northwestern peoples, namely the Vai, Mandingo, Mendi, Bandi, Loma, Bele, Ma, or Mano, and Da, also known as Gio, who are speakers of the Mande languages, and the Kisi and Gola, who are speakers of Mel languages. The southern and southeastern peoples have traditionally had less complex political structures, which were very largely based on lineage, with the heads of each of these lineages operating as more or less equals in a non-hierarchical structure. In the coastal areas, particularly in modern-day Maryland County, where the population was more dense, the political system was a little more complex, but still largely based on the strength of lineages and their heads. In the central, northern, and northwestern areas, there has been a greater tendency towards hierarchical political structures, in which at times there were groups of local communities or even differing language speakers who banded together to form confederations. The most famous of these was the Kondo Confederation, with its capital in Popolo during the late 18th and 19th century. The di division described here is not totally accurate, but for our purposes it will suffice. These basic differences in governance have remained a major distinction between the two, two areas up until the present day. As the settler-based central government began to assert its political control over the areas away from the original coast, coastal enclaves, largely in response to pressure from British and French colonial powers, which were claiming large neighboring tracts of territory, a governance system was established under President Arthur Barclay's government which was modeled after the British indirect rule policies. In a, in a nutshell, it was an attempt to work with pre-existing local leadership in the areas brought under central government control. Thus, the, the current chief of an area was to be the authority figure through which the interior commissioners sent out from Monrovia were to interact. But what often happened in, happened in the central, northern, and northwestern areas was the traditional leader did not become the recognized authority figure. To take two examples, among the Bandi, Bombolokoli, who had been the traditional leader of, of the southern and eastern Bandi, was bypassed for his young nephew, Mambu. The latter had curried favor with the central government commi commissioners. And as a consequence, it led to, uh, to conflict during the period from 1911 to 1914 with the assassination of eight chiefs loyal to Bombokole, the retaliatory killing of Mambu, and finally the flight of Bombokole to Sierra Leone. A similar pattern occurred in the Da or Gio area, where Tuazama, who was not a traditional leader, but a young aspiring man, was able to have himself recognized as chief by the central government. Thus, in these examples and many others, the seeds of dissension were sown between the local population and the central government. Thus, uh, on the surface, the power of the central government through its frontier force soldiers won the day. But until recent times, the dealings of the central government towards their ancestors were remembered with disfavor. 
the southeast, especially in the Quran area, where leadership was in the hands of lineage heads, who were essentially equals, as mentioned above, the concept of a hierarchical leadership structure was unknown to them. The choosing of chiefs was quite arbitrary and occurred usually because the opportunity arose for a man to win the approval of the local government uh, commissioner. As recently as 20 years ago, when meeting with members of a Quran town to discuss health issues, the request was made for the town chief to speak. What very quickly became clear was that the authority did not lie with him, but with the lineage heads. The town chief was dismissed as, quote, the government's man, unquote. He was not their chief, but the government's. Although the topic will be mentioned elsewhere, it is worth my adding that when discussing women's and children's health issues, Though males started to answer questions, they were quickly pushed aside by women who began to speak. Such behavior by women would never have occurred in the central, northern, or northwestern areas of Liberia. In the Kron region, women were overtly and socially closer in status to men in, in the public situations. Uh, and this was, their, was the normal behavior. In the central, northern, and northwestern areas, men were in, in overt social dominance. This is not to say that there was not a woman's world, which was the purview of women, but it was largely exercised outside of public view. It was men who essentially controlled the political arena. The elders who sat in consultation rarely included women, and if so, only those past childbearing age. There was in this central, northern, and northwestern region in the past a dynamic between the traditional political chief came to authority by virtue of lineage position and age, and the war chief, who achieved his position by virtue of his strength and bravery. Here there was internally, a, there was here, there was internally in this system a tension, with the war chief usually only able to assert temporary authority during periods of crisis. On occasion, however, such individuals would maintain their political power for their lifetime but very rarely was it transferred to their kinsmen. There are many individuals who can be described. One of those I am particularly familiar with is Zoloduma of Cape Mount, who ruled during the latter half of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th century. In his case, there are two differing viewpoints about his rise to power. In one case, there is the, quote, Western, unquote, explanation based on the fact that he had received special training to serve as a local agent for European traders on the coast, and thus he had access to economic resources not available to other Vi men. But from the Vi point of view, given that Zola Duma was seen as exceptional in being able to rise above other men, the only explanation was that there was a spiritual force or being who supported him, a Jinnai, with whom he had made a pact. And according to the traditions, for him to have received the special support, he had to commit an asocial act, namely murder. When he died of old age, he was buried, but quickly exhumed by other aspiring leaders, and his body was desecrated so that his power could not be transferred to others. This pattern of political leadership was widespread across the central, northern, and, north and northwestern parts of Liberia. And as everyone here will have noted, there, are, there were reminders of this pattern in the recent Civil War. In all parts of the country, there were very weak mechanisms to create and maintain peace, particularly between warring entities larger than the local lineage group, groups or clusters of related villages. In the southeast, for instance, among the Kron, there was sufficient land so that conflicting groups would just move apart. In more densely areas, as along the coast, for instance, among the Glebo, there was the very long-standing antagonisms between the Klemowe and the Nymowe, uh, which periodically spilled over into warfare, but which ultimately died by sheer lack of means to continue to support the conflict. In the Vai area, there were occasionally attempts by third parties to mediate, mediate disputes, but lacking power to enforce the peace, disputes quickly broke out again. 
Thus, thus there was, as was particularly evident from the documentation of the 19th century, a considerable amount of continual, continual conflict. Thus, the central government intervened, but to occupy the territory so as to take claim against which to hold the British and the colonial and the French colonial powers at bay. This was known in the terminology of the 19th and early 20th centuries as effective occupation. The last of this process of that form of occupation took place in, in the Sastown area of the Crew Coast in the mid-1930s with the defeat of Jua Nimle. Thus, Pax Liberica was exercised across the total territory of Liberia only fairly recently. With the power of the central authority, conflict was sub subdued. The central government then imposed mechanisms for adjudicating disputes. In most cases in the interior, it was through the indirect rule mechanism, where chiefs were given authority to hear disputes and render just, uh, decisions. And if the parties were not satisfied, they could appeal to the local commissioners appointed by the central government, and ultimately the case, the case might be heard by a tribunal in Monrovia at the Department of Interior. The new system essentially brought overt, violent conflict to an end. There was, however, a little unconstitutional problem to the structure. Members of the executive branch of the government were hearing and settling legal disputes. The case the court case was brought to the Supreme Court in the early part of the 20th century, and the court ruled that the structure was unconstitutional, but the court's decision was ignored for decades. More importantly, what we saw develop beginning with the presidency of Edwin Barclay was the increasing centralization of power, following on the subjugation of the peoples of Liberia. It was done as a mechanism to rule peoples who were not used to a modern democratic system. But although there were minor bows to the democratic process, by and large, it was a centralized control of the vast majority of the Liberian people. And the franchise was extended both to the women and in turn to the peoples of the, quote, hinterland, unquote. The choices provided to this new electorate were sharply controlled, so that free and open elect elections were only with rarity, free and open elections only uh, occurred with rarity. And this, then, and then this all unraveled. As I'm sure others will argue, with the overthrow of the leadership of the central administration in 1980, and in particular with the new leadership favoring people of certain regions and ethnic groups, the overarching control by force of the central government was weakened. As a consequence, there was an opportunity for disputes to flare up, which the central authorities had difficulty quashing. The top was off the box, and disputes spilled out, thereby allowing local warlords to arise. As a consequence, some of the patterns of violent disruption known from the past began to reemerge. How these disputes occurred and what the regional variations were, I leave up to individuals more knowledgeable in the recent history. What can be learned from this review? There are regional variations in Liberia, and they are real and continue to exist. Secondly, there was a need to reimpose central authority over all of the country in order to return, return to tranquility. This was finally achieved by unmilled troops in the final removal of the weak central political structure and its leader, Charles Taylor, and his government. How does one put the state back together? It is necessary to acknowledge in any new political structure that there are regional, and political, and social differences which any new structure of local governance will need to pay attention to. In addition, in the matter of dispute settlement, mechanisms need to be put in place that are appropriate and yet at the same time a standardized legal system needs to be made operative across the country. The lesson is that in designing, designing modern governance structures, non-hierarchical systems work better in the South and East, while, while more hierarchical, the, the more hierarch, hierarchical system will work in Central, North, and Northwest. Thus, the local people must be left to design, within a general structure, the political system that works best for themselves and not have the specifics of it imposed. 
As alluded to above, Liberia has had dual legal systems, the traditional and the statutory. In other words, to use my thinking, this has also been a troubled boundary. Many countries have had to wrestle with this problem. A unified legal system would alleviate competitiveness between the two systems, which in the past allowed litigants to play them against each other. Consequently, it made the legal situation unclear and the process was not respected. But let us go back and review a different phenomenon which ties into this dual legal system. Starting in Maryland County in the 19th century and then spreading outward, there has been the creation of dual villages, the traditional village and the, quote, civilized, unquote, Christian area. The underlying issue was that the Christian converts no longer wanted to be socially bound to the traditional systems of governance and belief. This, this old phenomenon has seen its expansion in recent time, into, into recent times. Starting in the 1960s, there are, though there are a few earlier instances, people deemed, quote, civilized, unquote, not only by themselves but by the central government, and thus in certain situations allowed to vote, began to exchange their individual separate villages for townships. This, in and of itself, was not surprising, as this was what the outside settlers had created to distinguish their areas of authority from that of traditional people's governance authority, government authority. However, in this case, it was not the people of overseas origin, but local people. In even more recent times, people in areas designated by the central government as districts from the indir indirect rule system petitioned the central government, namely the legislature, to have those areas designated as statutory districts. Likewise, there has been the escalation of the process by now moving to create cities. Grand Cru County, with a population by the recent census estimates of about 67,000 plus people, had 30 plus cities. Thus, thus, these decisions were presumably made so that all legal transactions un would occur under statutory law and not traditional law. This was the ostensible reason for change. However, I suspect no one was naive enough to believe that, that this was the only motivation for the creation of these new legal entities. The underlying old motiva motivation was undoubtedly there to move away from traditional governance systems, but there were certainly others who saw this as a way to create new government bureaucracies and thus new jobs. In the short term, it has caused considerable problems, especially in the creation of townships and cities, as in many cases, the new political entities have not followed the boundaries of the old tribal units. Thus, dual, dual systems thus continue to exist, and thus a troubled boundary has not been eliminated. I am aware of the work of the Election Commission, along with other govern, government entities, to try to, regular, to regularize political boundaries, namely the, the Boundary Harmonization Commission and of the proposed le legislation that is before the legislature. The general underlying point, however, is that those communities which have made the decision to be governed by statutory law should be encouraged. Ultimately, Liberia needs to come under one legal and unified system. The process has begun with some. In the end, the legal system with its courts will be the arbiter of the land. And this system functioning smoothly and fairly for all to seek justice will serve as the basis for the settlement of disputes. Any other manifestation of social disruptions, and in particular violence, which is outside of the law, will have to be controlled by effective policing an effective policing organization. I'm aware that the government is making great strides towards providing effectively, effectively, effectively a functioning court system across the country. Mag magistrates are being trained, buildings are, for the hearing of cases are being constructed. If the law is to be the standard whereby people's behavior is controlled, then there is a need to be aware of what the law consists of. That does not mean that many, other than lawyers, will have give it great attention, but it should be available. 
This means that copies should be widely dis distributed and placed in such institutions as high school libraries and, of course, in the local courthouses as well. Along these lines, in lines, it would seem reasonable that the combined acts of the legislature be reinstituted. The, pra the practice began in 1839, but was abruptly stopped in the 1960s. Today, the only docu documents available are the individual handbills, and there's no easy way to know what the full list of acts are which were passed by any legislative session. And another way to diminish tensions from disputes might be to consider the role of mediation in civil cases, which is sometimes called pre-trial conferences. One of the things which existed in the Danish legal system was the establishment of an arbitration or a mediation court. All civil cases had to first be heard by such a court in an attempt to see if compromise could be reached before they could proceed to a court of law. In a sense, the Liberian traditional system has had forms of this judicial concept where disputes were held before traditional leaders. Admittedly, they, were often, they often rendered judgment. The thought here is to establish a system whereby trained mediators are charged with trying to bring the litigants to an understanding or compromise. There would be no winners or losers, and there would be no judgment rendered. If the mediator was unsuccessful, then the dispute would move to, the to a judicial hearing. It would inject into the di dispute system the understanding that compromise is important rather than continued antagonism. Now, let us turn to other areas of the social system where there are, quote, troubled boundaries, unquote. In all societies, social differences are exploited to gain an advantage. Liberia is a very widely diverse clustering of peoples. There are 16 officially recognized languages, but in fact, many, in fact, from linguistic studies, there are many more. However, there are many areas of shared institutions and practices. In addition, the boundaries between groups were eminently malleable, so that what today is a shared behavior tomorrow is a significant divide. Certainly it is clear that very many people were multilingual, and they put many of us today to shame for our limit, limited linguistic abilities. But having said the above, it is evident that ethnicity is a significant factor in social interaction among peoples across the country. Although today one may not ask directly from which ethnic group a person comes, there is a desire to do so. As a substitute, one might ask, from what county did your family come? As an aside, I did that recently with a lady who runs a wonderful Liberian restaurant in Philadelphia. She told me she came from Red Light. That ended that line of question. Why is one interested? We think that ethnicity frames a person's background, their sense of self, and alliances. There is no doubt that people in a position to hire others will tend to hire those from their own background. We saw this in Doe's government. Greater shared values and loyalty are expected from one's own people. And we have seen it shape political organization. At a seminar in Washington in the 1980s, a discussion concerning political discord in Liberia took place, and the topic of ethnicity was raised. A suggestion was made by one of the participants that it might be possible to dampen ethnic tensions by creating counties based on ethnicity, thus allowing those particular groups to govern themselves and not to share it, it with others, as was often the case. The idea was roundly dismissed as giving in to this social division. And yet, what has happened? Bomi County was created, with its majority base being Gola. River G County was created, with, uh, was created from Grand Jetta, largely because they were Grebo speakers in a county which was dominated by Crom. Other examples can be, can be cited. Thus, the reality of the ethnic self-perception is real, and certainly we saw ethnicity play itself out in the recent civil war. 
There is no question that in any dispute, people will try to use differences as a basis to dividing themselves from others. Ethnicity is definitely one of those definitions which people have of themselves and that they use as a way to think of others. This is, particularly is a particularly interesting matter when a person is of mixed ethnic background. At a seminar which I attended last summer here in Liberia for local citizens, Liberian culture was discussed. What became clear as the seminar progressed was that the participants did not know each other. That is, in the sense that they believed that the cultural institutions and social structures of their own background was the same for all of the other people at the seminar. The participants began to realize that this was not the case as in individuals began to challenge the cultural patterns of some participants. The perceived differences are real. One has only to look at the recent tensions which have arisen again between the people of Grand Jeddah and those of Nimba. One way to break down this troubled boundary might be to find mechanisms for Liberians to get to know each other. The president has begun the process by holding her cabinet meetings in different parts of the, of the country. Here I would suggest that another way to do this is for university students to be placed during vacation periods in other parts of the country that are, uh, that are uh, not of their, own, uh, of their own background for a month, possibly twice during their four-year academic years of training. During that month, they would live with a local family and they would do some form of social service. For instance, helping others in the community in a work camp building or repairing something that was of, that the community chooses, doing vacation teaching, giving assistance in a local health facility, and so forth. These practices are widely done in many parts of the world, and there's no reason why they cannot be tried in Liberia. The exposure to people in other parts of the country is an invaluable part of widening the horizons of students. In the end, the nation as a whole will benefit. In addition, as part of civil law on discrimination, ethnicity must become a protected status by the courts. Discrimination on the basis of people's perceptions of one's ethnicity must be made punishable. Another area of great importance to the reconstruction of the nation is the need to weaken a social and political system based on privilege. For far too long, social differences based on wealth, education, and health care, which provided a, a better quality of life, have been the norm. For all of the moves by the last two true Whig party presidents to improve the standard of life, the chasm between rich and poor, privileged and humble, strong and weak, remained notable process initiated by the presidents to change these conditions did occur, but the problem was enormous and the change was not as fast as hoped. In addition, because the process had begun, because the process had begun, expectations of improved social conditions, conditions rose far faster than they could be delivered. This then was another troubled social boundary that existed prior to the 1980 coup. In addition, probably partially due to the social disparities, but also because a fundamentally different social system was being imposed on the various peoples of, of Liberian society, I think it can be argued that a new system based on trust was demanded. If in the past individuals who largely obtained what they desired, admittedly with some social, socially constrained circumstances, a new social order which demanded that all individuals work honorably, loyally, and with a sense of obligation towards others was a social change that was difficult to make. I mentioned in the beginning that certain new ideas fall on fertile ground, but many do not resonate, and thus there are, they are either rejected or grudgingly accepted when imposed, but with undercurrents of discontent. And when these new demands occur in a social setting where the old norms of the village, including economic and emotional sustenance, were no longer valid, it was not surprising that a social behavior arose. People look out for themselves and their kinsmen. There was a kind of free-for-all 
to make sure that one survived. All of these patterns of behavior had to be re reined in, have to be reined in in the new modern social system. Into this mix also come new paradigms of social interaction that involved matters concerning gender. If we take as the central fo focus of this examination troubled boundaries in the society, gender is one of the fundamentals of most societies, including Liberia. Liberia. It's less than a hundred years ago that in many areas of Liberia, women were seen purely as objects. They could be pawned, exchanged, or sold by men. In addition, it was women who, along with children, bore the brunt of civil conflict. In this fundamental social divide, women had little, say, little or no say in their fate. And so domestic relations were one of the most troubled areas of social life. One observer has stated that he thought that about 90% of, of all cases of lit litigation during the Pax Liberica period revolve, revolved around, from the men's point of view, woman palava. This boundary of instability may not have led to the actual civil war, but it was a factor in a widespread undercurrent of social discontent. Matters over the past many decades have moved toward toward the improvement of women's social positions, including the granting of the vote, active involvement in the political process, the new domestic relations law, and more recently, the right of inheritance. But it is still clear that many have yet to reach the recognition that women deserve to be equal players in all matters. The fact that the nation elected its first female president has gone a long way in this direction, but, it's, but uh, there is much to be done. In this case, particular in the more conservative areas of the country. The process is currently being monitored by both civil society organizations as well as by the Ministry of Gender. One of the ways that improvements are being made is by sensitization meetings for women on their rights and responsibilities and on choices they can feel free to make which were not possible until recently. Along these lines, work needs to be done with men also to change their attitudes to, towards what were believed to be the narrowly defined roles which only women might play. And to explain what is important to everyone, including men, that women make choices for themselves freely. True, men may need also to change the way they relate to women and to achieve the privilege of having an equal relationship with women. I am also aware that the TRC held women's thematic hearings this will help not only to heal wounds, but also to further the process of making women an equal part of the society. The emphasis then must ultimately be in finding ways to make absolutely sure that women are full and equal members of Liberian society. Any actions taken in this direction must have the full support of the state and ultimately of the society, and thereby cause the diminution of this socially troubled boundary. Another matter which involves a major transformation for most of the people of Liberia involves, uh, revolves around the issue of how individuals and groups have access to land. In the past, with some limited exceptions, land was usually not contested. The population was generally sparse, and thus access to land was fairly easy. Thus, it was mainly people not land, who were the subject of contestation. The concern of leaders was to accumulate sufficient numbers of people to work the land. The use of slavery was one such way. People, and in particular women, in fact, had more value than land. The ex exceptions to the previous comments were where land was limited, namely in high population density areas. These usually were along the coast, where people could no longer continue to spread out. In addition, there were newer groups from the interior trying to gain access to the coast and salt or outside, for salt and, or outside trading possibilities, which, and these would, uh, caused troubled uh, territorial disputes. However, as sta stated, above these were the exceptions for the vast portion of what is modern-day Liberia, disputes revolved around claiming people, not land. 
Thus, although groups of people usually knew where the boundary was between themselves and others, given the fluid nature of political control, groups of people moved backwards and forwards, being connected to one group or pulled away to another. Land largely only became a problem when the central government moved towards indirect political control in order to stabilize the political entities, which came to be known as clans and chieftains. Only then did the, the boundary between one such group and another become significant. Presidents King and Edwin Barclay spent an in inordinate amount of time adjudicating and stabilizing those boundaries. As a con in consequence, contestation shifted from people to territory. What was created by the central government was something which was called, quote, tribal land, unquote. This was normally controlled by the local political authorities, such as clan chiefs or paramount chiefs. However, this clashed with the nation's right to the land, thus any, thus any quote, unoccupied land uh, uh, belonged automatically to the nation. In addition, the state had sovereignty over all of the territory within its boundaries. This included rights to all minerals below the surface of the topsoil. So many, quote, troubled boundaries, unquote, in both the sense of land, but more importantly socially, were created by the central government imposed control. And if this was not enough, not enough, land could be alienated from local peoples by the authority, the authority of their chiefs and elders so that legal title could be given to private individuals or groups. Talk about troubled boundaries. They were numerous. In more recent times, the title land was usually surveyed, the document to the land was registered with the State Department now Foreign Affairs, and a deed was granted. However, record keeping has had its challenges, to put it mildly. And many of those records have been misplaced or lost, allowing for claims on land that were, all, that were not always legitimate. There is a monumental task ahead to bring order to this dilemma, and the current government has proposed the creation of a land commission, the legislation of which is now before the national legislature. Another issue which is raised, which involves all of the diversity of people since social changes which have occurred in Liberia. And as a consequence of this, there is a need for the creation of some overarching ent uh, entity which tries to bring some coherence to it all. Here I'm thinking about the need for a, for a national identity, and with that, a national purpose. As Wilton Sangolo has, re has said recently, quote, we have got an, an identity crisis in this nation. I am aware that there have been discussions to create a commission. It is possible that a sense of national purpose will lead to the diminishing of disputes as the recognition, as the recognition is that there is a need for work to, for, to work for common good. I know that one of the, the subjects uh, is that of national symbols, which has been raised by many people. There are other aspects of this subject as well. For instance, the need to create a national history. A group needs to be assembled to define what is desired as guidelines for such a history. What will give national pride? There are the achievements which, can be, which are to be celebrated, such as the Vi script and subsequent scripts among several groups. The achievements of crew men who successfully found economic opportunities as sailors along the West African coast, returning to their communities with new ideas from the outside world. The artistic achievements of many Liberian communities. There is the first novel written in black Africa, created by a Vi man. Some of the most aesthetically pleasing carvings in Africa, highly appreciated by the world community, come from Liberia. I think of the achievements of the Mano and the Don, that is the Gio, carvers, among others. There are, was also the remarkable use of brass to create both ornaments and figures. There was the important ability to make iron, examples of which have been seen both in the Kbele country and in the Putu area. The cultural center at Kendija in the past has highlighted the beauty of dancing from various parts of Liberia. 
These are just a few achievements to be named. There is also the past history of conflict, which must be addressed. Not unlike what this commission is doing, the different types of conflict need to be brought into the open. Liberia was not a unique, unique in this. Just look at the long history of conflict which existed in Europe, just to name one area of the world. Not only is it to be described, but also it needs to be explained. What was the nature of the social and political systems which existed, but also what mechanisms existed or not that allowed for the settlement of disputes. This past heritage is important to understand. It helps to make sense of the role of the central that the central government played in the bringing Liberia's diverse population under political control. How did the central government impose a Pax Liberica over the territory which today is the modern Liberia? There is in this process not only the ending of internal conflict, but also the cessation of hostilities towards the, the state. And then there were the men and women who tried to cross the social boundary between their traditional backgrounds and the modern. For instance, Momolo Masakoy, Didwo Twe, Victoria Elizabeth Gillamo Grimes, George Bafofo Peabody, Banyene Bay Wolo, and Robert Johnson, better known as Jala Mali, just to name a few among many. Their lives were often difficult, but they made the effort, and that is to be celebrated. Here I echo, a recent, uh, I echo recent editorials in the Daily Observer urging Liberians to learn about prominent figures in Liberia's past. What is clear is that Liberians need to know themselves and their diverse history. The coming of the settlers from the New World is only a very small part of that history. Today is the time to begin the process of bringing the past to light so that Liberians can have a sense of pride in who they are as part of the national healing. This leads finally, in my arbitrary choice of contested boundaries, to the spiritual world. There are divisions in Liberian society, for instance, those who are members of a monotheistic religion versus those who believe in the traditional world of spirits. Into this mix are those who welcome change and those who desire the comforts of a world of continuity from the past. In the latter case, at times, issues are raised about what is to be, uh, it is to be in a modern society and what must be banned because it goes against what is termed in the modern society basic human rights. Thus, the killing of individuals for body parts, parts for instance, is seen by most of the world as abhorrent. The practice, as is well, as is well known in Liberia, uh, is hard to ban. Returning to a theme stated earlier, one kind of mechanism usually urged by social scientists is to try to figure out a mechanism to transform the practice to something socially acceptable to a modern society. However, in some cases, it is hard to put, uh, hard to figure out how to transform, in this case, part men. And thus the only ch choice is to outright ban it and use the full force of the state to impl implement the ban. These kinds of situations, however, need to be the exceptions to the changing social, to changing social practices. There's another area of social religious practice which might be treated differently. This concerns the matter of clitorodectomies, a difficult subject with people having strong feelings on both sides. As an example of this transformation, uh, as an example of this transformation, uh, 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 was, uh, was uh, suggested to me recently in the United States. The Ghanaians, who also have the practice, have in the American urban setting taken the young girls off to a motel for a weekend. There they are given a concentrated course in what is expected of a Ghanaian woman. At the end of the weekend, the girls are celebrated as having become women before they return to their homes. Thus, Ghanaians have maintained the core principle of the girl's initiation, the principle of transformation, but without the, without the clitorodectomy, creating, if you like, a girl's finishing school. Traditionally, the spirit world 
was a mechanism for societies to reinforce social practices by using spiritual sanctions to shape people's social behavior, and thus to provide a means of social control. At least, this was possible within the local social grouping, though similarity of such patterns might be widespread, allowing people to move or be moved from one grouping to another without facing a, a totally different social system. Here I'm thinking about the world of peoples of central, northern, and north northwestern parts of Liberia and their institutions of Poro and Sandy. Similarities in patterns of behavior and belief came to be called a cultural area by social scientists. Although the institutions did not have overarching control, they did provide a means whereby individuals could move from one community to another with little disruption of their social beliefs. At a fairly early time in the northern and northwestern part of Liberia, individuals, mainly Mandinka speakers, Mandingos, penetrated into the forest regions in search of kola nuts and commodities from the coast, including salt. They brought with them Islam, but in a form that was tolerant towards the diverse people they met. The rate of conversion was slow and limited, though often when it occurred, as in the Vai area, it was the leaders of the communities who saw this as a mechanism to rise above others. Thus, if there were conflicts between different religious groups, they usually re revolved around other matters than religion, such as differences in wealth or cross-access of each group to the women of the other group. In the case of Christianity, the process was a little different. Initially, some individuals from the local traditional societies, mainly boys, became wards in settler homes. It was a useful mechanism on many levels. But for the matter at hand, these boys came into Christian homes and often were converted. On their return to their traditional towns, they may have not have continued Christian practices, but they understood something of what Christianity was about. With the coming of the central government's political control over the interior, by the 1920s, the interior areas were open to Christian missionaries, and each denomination was given a particular portion of the country, so that at least initially each denom denomination would not clash with another uh, overwinning converts. However, many of these uh, churches set about in their conversion practice to destroy lo the local religious practices. And as a consequence, a new contested boundary was created. There are stories in certain areas of the country where the missionaries forced local people to bring their religious objects out and to publicly burn them. By this time, if objections arose, the missionaries had the support of the central government and its military, the frontier force, to back them up. The, thus, although on the surface the discord was muted, underneath there remained the ongoing objections to what was being opposed. There was another aspect of the convert. There was another aspect of the conversion process. It was very different in the south and the east from the central and northwest. In the former, in the south and the east, the converts had a very strong aversion to continued to continue to compromise with their past belief systems, and so made a major transform transformation to a totally different system. Thus, as we have seen. There was the demand to create civilized towns separate from the towns where traditional practices were continued. This phenomenon did not occur in the central, northern, and northwestern parts of Liberia. Here, Christian converts lived side by side with their traditionalist relatives. Again, we see the regional variation. In the former areas, contested boundaries were created between Christians and non-Christians, which caused difficulties in the two types of communities to live by side, side by side. In the rest of the country, this was not a particular problem. What I have tried to point out here is that there were a wide variety of conflicted social boundaries. Some were openly and violently contested. In other cases, they were submerged. The latter created a social undercurrent of tension. Thus, when violence did break out, it was not necessarily solely based on the overt state, stated reason for disruption, but may also have had a more deeply rooted basis in the particular societies. When the central government then superimposed its military might upon these societies, all of the contested social boundaries were submerged. However, in some cases, new underlying tensions were also created. 
as the imposers of this social control were essentially the returned Afri uh, American Africans, local ethnic tensions were also submerged. Once the leadership of the centrally controlled government was overthrown, and the new leaders were from particular, uh, from particular ethnic groups took charge, the Pandora's box was opened, and the potential uh, localized rivalries based on ethnicity or regional residents were unleashed. Also, the new central authorities began to lose control over particular parts of the country, and thus the forces for civil war were created. In some ways, the days prior to the mid-1930s were returned to, but in a new and larger and in some ways more national form, rather than the earlier, more localized form. The consequence has been the chaos of nearly 14 years. How does today's society deal with these troubled boundaries? As we have seen, mercifully, outside, outside military troops have, were deployed to return the country to peace by imposing military force on the various peoples of the country. In the long term, although new Liberian police and military forces are, are being created, it is the underlying tensions that must have atten uh, tensions which must have, must have attention today. The government's poverty reduction strategy developed by Liberians and external don donors will address many of the overt and important areas. However, there are other areas not mentioned in this new roadmap for Liberia. They are often the more intangible areas, some of which have been mentioned here. Ultimately, it is the sustaining of all of the proposed areas for change that must be continued. The Poverty Reduction Strategy document has built into it some ongoing monitoring systems. As I have indicated, there are further areas not mentioned in this important document which need to which, which have to be addressed. It may be useful to lay out all of the contested boundaries which can be identified. In addition, attention needs to be paid on how the various disputed boundaries are interrelated. Once this is done, then mechanisms uh, may be set into place to watch how each of these areas of conflict are being given attention and by whom. Finally, an annual monitoring and review should be taken for each disputed area and a report written on the progress being made and what needs uh, further attention. This could be done in a manner similar to an annual human rights, the human uh, rights reports which are published by certain governments looking at problematic countries around the world. As an unnamed former president has stated, quote, we, can, we cannot get vexed with history, unquote. We need to study it, learn from it, and create the desired future. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I welcome any questions which you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Olson, for your presentation before this panel of commissioners. You premised your presentation on what you call troubled boundaries. Boundaries spanning across social, economic, political, cultural, and ethnic divide in our country. You also went for to identify all of these conflicting issues uh, not necessarily as direct sources of the conflict, but these boundary issues, these trouble boundaries, have created an environment of conflict for Liberia. And you identified key indicators that our country could attempt to resolve in order to move forward. The dichotomy of the legal system, the crisis of identity, access to land, socialization, all of those going back to the founding of the country have existed up to now. We also identified two political structures that were in place prior to the coming of the settlers. And you thought that lessons could be learned from what those experiences were and how we want our country to go forward. I want to thank you very much for coming and making this splendid presentation today. Uh, it is time to ask questions from commissioners but we'll take an hour's break and then return for questions and answers. Thank you very much.
Mr. Hero, officer, the commission will recess for one hour and return thereafter.